my favorite part growing in the kampung house is the freedom that I had when I was young. Uh, we used to roam around here, we used to play in the tree house, we used to catch chickens, we used to find insects. And that memory is always there in my mind. Huh? You know, if you stay in the kampung, huh? your door is open wide. Your neighbour can step in and you can step in your neighbour's house also. No restriction, even among any races. We sort of forgot these sensible decisions that has been undertaken in the building of the kampong houses. When you really look at vernacular forms of architecture, you can see how many solutions there are in front of us for how to solve the problems that we still need to deal with today. I miss so much about Kampung life because I can go everywhere, you, know, you can go to the neighbor house to chat. This Kampung Law. I'm a Kampung boy from, from young, from here. When my parents shifted here, my mother was pregnant. So when she said they make this house and give her homie on this come out. This Kampung house, this space is very big, and then you feel more relaxed. Because one house, uh, we got three photos to in out. No? The, the secret of a Kampung house, uh, the wood, uh, the wood normally, uh, if you know what type of oil or what type of paint, uh, you just do it. Uh. This is 58 years now, most of the wood still going strong. So when I reached 27, then I fitted out. I married, uh, I shipped out. When I come back, normally weekend, uh, all my brothers and sisters, you know, we were called then. They will come with pot luck, you know, luck, uh. I really want to come back here and still enjoy my, you know, my kampung life with my whole family. But actually, uh, my kids all really scared about this kampung. <laughs> Most of them scared of frog, the lizard. You know, the lizard in kampung house is not a small lizard, no. It's all a big lizard. At night, during night, uh, they quiet and they, they can hear the cricket sound. Uh. <laughs> it worried because they never, never heard this type of thing before. So they thought, they then, you know, the light uh, is not so bright. You know, so they worry, they want to go further, so they worry, they're scared. My pick on kampong houses is really imagining a group of people that has got no prior architecture education, but they are able to put together a space, a dwelling, comfortable enough for themselves with the limited resources. But yet, at the same time, they try to maximize the comfort. This is sort of the underlying philosophy that, that I hope to adopt from the kampong house. Design for tropical living is to not deny the fact that we are living in the tropics. It means that we should learn how to enjoy the weather a little bit more. Because if you ask anyone on the street, the first word that they'll tell you about Singapore weather is, is hot. So 
we felt that maybe that's a tad too extreme. We definitely wanted to design a very open concept house by cutting voids through the volume, both for chance encounters between the inhabitants and also for the weather to sort of creep in where the inhabitants start to realise the nuances that I talk about in our tropical weather. By doing so, I think we also encourage them to tailor their ritual around this tropical weather. One very good example was how my client's father-in-law would actually sit along the corridor which we had created as a wind tunnel. He had sort of recognised there's going to be this afternoon breeze and he started to craft his daily ritual based on his knowledge of the tropical weather. I mean, it's not a literal kampong house, but I think there were many elements of the kampongness that you can find in this house that makes it interesting to live in. Almost at any time of the day, as long as you are in an open space, you are connected to the weather outside. You develop a kind of realisation of how the weather changes. In terms of the old house itself, the design of the house was quite closed up so there was a lack of airflow. So these were elements where we wanted to change so that in the new house itself, we could try to live um, in an environment where we could minimise the use of aircon. At the same time, the parents have a place of their own. We have a place of our own. Um, my daughter has a place. The cats also have you know, more space to run around. When we first came to the site, what we found was quite surprising was actually the orientation of the house was quite strategically aligned to the northeast and southwest monsoon, which means that there is actually an opportunity to get the breeze all year round. The other thing which I would consider a challenge is, Esther said, please be as prudent as possible. We wanted to make sure that we've designed just enough for the family. Very often, we've seen homeowners saying that they would try to fill every single square foot of the plot of land with rooms because of real estate value. That is sort of counterintuitive to just designing a space where it is enough and sufficient. Because in kampong houses, I don't think they're built for real estate. The favourite part of this house is definitely behind the ventilation blocks where the walk-in wardrobe or the toilets are. Partly because we were pleasantly surprised by how effective it was. It is testament to what we've been trying to advocate. How people start to opportunistically recognise some of these things that we try to design and use them in their own way. It's a place for growth. So when you're a kid, you would relate to your home as a place where you grew up, where you have memories of, where there'll be spaces that you enjoy and are familiar with, or certain spaces where you would um, have interactions with you know, your grandmother or your friends. But it's a place where I think an accumulation of memories and where we hope it allows us to see how the physical space changes and ages together with us in a beautiful way, I guess. Most people would say, oh, why did you give up such a big area, right? You could have built up, put in two more rooms. Between my husband and I, we felt that if we kept it as a balcony, it would make the house feel a lot more open and airy. And I do my yoga here almost every day. So it's my own little, like, haven. When it rains, this place feels a bit like me doing yoga in a place in Bali itself. It's hard to describe that kind of sensory feeling, the sound and the temperature 
and the wind that just comes into contact with your body all just coming together and you sort of, it's a familiar feeling and I felt that in Bali. These three cats live in a household, so we needed to have spaces where they could call their own. Because cats are very territorial, so I think the house itself allows them to do that. Um, if you see like, the structures and the beams, it was actually designed in a way where we imagined them to be able to explore the house in these areas where we humans wouldn't be able to go to. So it becomes a playground of theirs, but at the same time, we wanted to ensure they were safe. So interestingly, like all these vertical elements on the railings, we made the effort to actually like measure the head of our cat to make sure that they can't fit their head through. We spent a lot of time trying to outsmart the cat. We were always thinking maybe the cat's going to make a run for it. So it was quite challenging because instead of just saying we are designing for humans, we are also partially designing for the animals. Home is a space, but it is also a place. It is where perhaps interactions and presence of each other's existence in harmony could take place. It is the place where social contracts happen. And through this, I think that's where a home can emerge. Island, I stay in the HDB flats. So we always close our door. We will be inside a box. But in Ubin, I can sit outside here. I even can go to the seaside. I just sit there, then I can do whatever I want. So it's very relaxed and very peaceful. One of the fondest memories is myself, my brother and my father fishing at the mouth of the Mataikan River. We caught worms from the beach and then uh, we fish for this ikan passe, a white fish. My mother will cook it for dinner. I think those are very happy times. My mum will drive us to the mata ikan, the beach. The journey is very interesting. You will find a lot of uh, holiday bungalows. I remember people telling me that it was uh, King Kong, uh, our Singapore world champion wrestler and also uh, Mr. David Marshall and the Who's Who, they have uh, what you call weekend holiday bungalows by the beach. The veranda is a significant component of the kampong. It forms the threshold between a private space and a public space where people could sit out and greet the other people that are actually passing through the spaces. Most people will call it a kampong spirit. That is something that we try to learn from, but we are also sensitive to the fact that we are no longer the sort of agrarian society that it used to be. One example is the staircase behind us. It is actually constructed out of a folded, perforated sheet. Uh, it allows one to be aware of another person's presence while you're walking up the stairs. Every morning, the daughter would actually wake up and greet the grandmother through the perforated sheet. And we have a lot of semi-outdoor spaces. These semi-outdoor spaces allow the activities to flow out. Um, people get out of their air-conditioned boxes and they start to realise what the weather can bring to them. 
Um, this is also where we feel the most interaction can happen. And we imagine this to be almost like a huge playground that they actually grow up with. It's a good way for the children to grow up. It's the right way for them to mix freely rather than keep themselves in the house by itself. You know, if you stay in a kampong, huh? your door is open wide. And your neighbour can step in and you can step in your neighbour's house also. No restriction, even among any races. Nothing happened. <laughs> we are so, so free to interact with each other. You see, the life as such, no? we never bear in mind. <laughs> Changi, which uh, I'm quite familiar with because uh, during my school holidays, we used to form a small group, we cycle from Gelang up to Changi village. A very interesting place, we cycle up the hill and down the hill. And it was really uh, a real uh, kampong site. Further down, the Singapore exposed, there was uh, Kosiak Lim, which is a flooded area. And opposite uh, the, the Singapore University, there was a road that goes to Mapa Road. Uh, you can walk through uh, to the seaside, the East Coast seaside. Kids, uh, mum will drive her uh, Austin A40, which is the uh, car in those days were very popular. And we'll bring the whole family down to uh, the beach uh, in Mata Ikan. And of course, we have to go to Sumapa Village, which is uh, 10 miles away from the city centre. You know, all the way from North Richfield to South Richfield High Street. So going to Changi is always uh, an outing, you know, like the present day driving to Malacca or whatever. I think uh, it's because of our relative there who runs a provision shop on the beach uh, called Mata Ikan. That's the reason for going out. If you go down to Somapa, you will see that home is an entire village. You know, your neighbours, they look out for you, you look out for them, and the Gotong Groyong spirit, uh, the whole village will come out and help. Their telecommunications, they don't have handphones, and, and uh, some don't have phones, but when they send message from the main road, you know, um, they see somebody who's going home, their neighbours, they'll pass a message, tell mum I'm in the outdoor cinema, I mean the uh, open air cinema, and I'll be back home late. You know, the messages were just passed. The school and the terrace houses were actually the landmark opposite uh, Soma Park. They are all gone now because of the MRT and uh, the terrace houses were converted into the um, condo. And uh, the overhead bridges were, the linked up was also removed. That's uh, progress, isn't it? It was all kampung house and now, you know, you got monster buildings, <laughs> commercial monster buildings, factories. Cannot even see where the sea line is. This is my great great grandfather's house. I'm the fifth generation. I grew up in this house. My mom was born in this house, and of course I was born in Singapore, but we do come here often to gather with the family here. So um, I think I'm one of the lucky few of generations who can say that I enjoy kampong life, life lifestyle. Um, I mean, looking at this place itself, nothing changed. It's still, it's, it's sort of like timeless. The tree is still there, you know, we don't have electricity, and there's no Wi-Fi, no icon. 
My favorite part growing in the Kampung house in Pulau Bien is the freedom that I have when I was young. Uh, we used to roam around here, we used to play in the tree house, we used to catch chickens, we used to find insects. Uh, that memories is always there in my mind. Uh. It sticks to me. And I'm lucky that my sixth generation, my son, has a chance to do so. I can just bring him over and you know, one day maybe he's seven generations, so I hope that this continues. If you look at Pulau Ubin, we would find that actually the houses, they, they manifest a dynamic building scene. The types of uh, houses that you find, uh, they are of two basic models, uh, but there are also a lot of different in-between types. So the two main models rather of the kampung house that we can distinguish when you look at kampung houses everywhere, the older customary type of Malay kampung house that we call the rumah serambi. So it actually has a gable roof, followed by two less steeply inclined lean-to roofs. So it, uh, if you look at it from the side, it would look like this. It's distinguished by having a long gallery on the front. That's the serambi, a kind of veranda. So a rumah limas uh, has a different roof form. It's not the gable roof but a hip roof, sometimes with a little triangle, the gablet. Uh, usually for Lima's house, it's rectangular as well, but if, it's usually with the short side to the front. And on one side or in the middle of this short side, is a projecting building called the Anjum or the Surong. There is such a thing as a Chinese type of kampung house. Uh, built directly on the ground with a symmetrical front with a kitchen either to one side or to the back. And uh, what's very fascinating about kampung houses is that the architects who are recorded to have built them could come from different ethnic groups. So you could have a Malay person designing a Chinese kampung house. In some occasions, you have a Chinese architect or Chinese carpenter building for a Malay client. What's interesting about the kampung house is that the formal typology is somewhat like a kit of parts uh, that you assemble together. Uh, you have uh, the main house, the core house, right? And then you have uh, additions to the front, different kinds of entrance spaces, transition spaces. You know, the system of building a Malay house was what everybody followed, right? It was a shared uh, architectural language. It was, I think, economic crisis during that time. So I, I and my husband uh, decide maybe we can take a rest, take a break. So we come into Ubin with um, have a friend staying here. So we came in. So uh, we stay at his place. Then I realized it's a very peaceful and beautiful island. A lot of uh, new generation in Singapore they do not know what is kampung life. So I'm so surprised. So that's why I always tell uh, the parents, bring your children, come to Ubin. Maybe they can see a lot of things. Because Ubin got guabo, we got uh, jungle fowl, uh, we have snake. Once you walk around, maybe you, uh, you go and observe, you can see a lot of things. In Ubin, it's a very nature place. We don't have um, HDB flats, we don't have a supermarket. We don't have a karaoke room. I always tell the parents, this is a nature classroom. whole family, we really fall in love with this Carmichael estate. It's peaceful, quiet, and the most important thing is that we felt that here have the kampong spirit. I live by creating this arena here at this location, 
we have brought a wide variety of people from all walks of life, parents, kids, families, and even working adults who swing by here to, do, to engage in some activities, just like the uh, football academy. And I would say the most favorite part of this place is it is exclusive and yet convenient for many people to come. If you look at vernacular houses uh, in the Southeast Asian tradition, if you look at the roof form, there is that big volume at the top and there are always small openings because, you know, by using the venturi effect, you push the hot air out of the house. It's about uh, making the space breathe. You need ventilation. So you, you really need your courtyards. You need air movement. That's really the essence of chocolate living. I previously designed a semi-detached house. The brief for this house is fairly similar to the brief for the semi-detached house. And from the time I designed their first house, uh, and they always want to have that flexibility, that sense of change. And this also captures you know, my initial idea of designing the bungalow as a loft. Having the relationship with Vincent during the first house, it took us about two years, the journey, and we really built up that relationship and I like his, um, I like his, his way of pushing boundary and willing to take up challenge. And I told him that what I hope to achieve in the new house is more of a resort-like. Um, of course, we had to compromise on the build-up to enjoy the space and to be different. What you see here is a double volume space that starts from the front, continues all the way to the back. What I've done is to put the communal spaces here. And on the second story is a mezzanine. Mezzanine which serves as a family space for the family because the bedrooms are just adjacent to the space over here. And as you can see, there's not really an assigned function. They put in a hammock, so they just chill here. The second story follows the same simplicity as the first story. From the mezzanine, it also allows you visual connection to the dry kitchen and also the living room. I want the family to be able to communicate with each other, whether they're on the first story or from the mezzanine, they can see and talk to each other. To me, a home, when you come back, you feel very comfortable with the space. It does not need to be very elaborate. Since um, I have a lap pool, so I swim more. I get to the outdoor more often. And um, yeah, we enjoy the greenery. <laughs> it's very close to nature. <laughs> You know, after conceptualizing the idea of the house, we know it's going to be very natural, natural uh, material. And those that's offered in, in Singapore, um, either it's too costly, it's not to what we like. For example, like the pool that we have here is using natural lava tiles. And if we're going to get it locally, it's going to be very costly. I think the natural choice is to visit Indonesia, Samarang. Um, Chapara, where it's heart of manufacturing or furniture. Another thing that's really cool about this client is um, they understand patina. They understand, you know, that like, you know materials have this sense of uh, passage of time, that things age, and they like nature. They like water. It actually gave me a lot of room to think about materials that have character.
We were taken to a lot of factories and we were shown a lot, a lot of tiles, van blocks, I mean. And it was by chance, on the very last day, as we were leaving the factory, I saw one of these that you see in the house, the brick van block, sitting by a drain. And we told the guy, that's the one we want. He couldn't believe us. <laughs> when I look at this van block, Stylistically, it speaks tropical. Uh, not just because of its function or its purpose, but also in terms of its colour, because it is sort of also reminiscent of you know, houses that we see in the past when there's no air conditioning. And you know, you have van blocks because you need to facilitate air movement through the house. You choose materials not just on the performance. Uh, you also choose it sometimes for sensory purposes or to create a modern tropical look. So the other thing I was looking for, actually I was looking for Malaccan brick tiles, the antique ones, which are really hard to find. For the reason that this house, uh, when it was built, we didn't tear the entire house down. We took away most of it, but I kept the core of the house. And I wanted to at least leave a trace and to at least face that one wall of that core of that house with an antique brick. It was really, again, by chance because you know, uh, school was being demolished in Java, Eddie found a pile of old bricks. And so he shipped them over and we put them on the wall by the dining room. It was a really fun process, uh, if I may say so. Of, you know, looking at materials, but first of all, thinking about the materials, thinking about the environment you want to create, thinking about the effect uh, it has on the well-being of the user. At that time, there was an announcement that they're going to um, dismantle the railway. Um, they need to um, get rid of the material. A fellow friend um, called me and offered me because he knows that I'm building a house. So I straight away jumped on it and got our guys to um, pick it up. Knowing that every piece comes from Tanjong Pagar Railway um, Station, uh, it means a lot of uh, richness to us. The moment you enter to the house, you're able to experience it. I love pets. That's where my um, childhood a dream to have, you know, all the animals that I can um, have my hand on. You know, I have uh, parrots, um, a mako, um, and so um, pheasants from uh, Europe, dogs. You know, this house gave me the um, ability to be able to house them. It, it just brings me back to a, a little bit of that, you know, the kampong days. We're able to feed them and um, yeah, spend some quiet moment just looking at them. To live in a house like this, you need to be, am I right to use the word more forgiving in terms of uh, tidiness? As you can see, um, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, greenery, a lot of um, leaves. You expect it to uh, dirty up the place, um, and you have to adopt it and look at a natural site. So we get to enjoy it over the years. I think it's, it's a part of um, a place that we can um, be ourselves. The comfort of being surrounded by the family members, that is so important. You know, when you're out there, you know, um, having a business discussion or, or meetings. It's, it's very different from the moment you step into a, a home, right? You can just be yourself and everybody has that, uh, be comfortable with each other. So, I think we have um, achieved that um, in, in, in this house. One of the fun things working in Halia and the Botanic Gardens are the visitors that we get. 
So you're going to find squirrels coming to say hello every now and then. Uh, you have your monitor lizards, but of course they don't come to the restaurant, so don't worry about that. And then you get your occasional monkey that will come and say hello as well. My favourite part of the Botanic Gardens is the forest trail. It's quite amazing that in Singapore, uh, you have a city and a garden and a forest in the middle. My favourite part of Adam Road Food Centre is, on top of my nasi lemak, is the iconic place which is surrounded by all historic places around here. When we were first commissioned to do the house, we, we knew that the house was very close to botanical gardens. And so thinking about nature became one of the first starting points of designing the house. Which is to say that in most modern houses with nature, nature is still usually quite separate. So in this house, I wanted to explore how we can bring nature and architecture very closely together. In a way, it becomes one together. When people talk about kampong housing, the first thing that people think about is pitch roofs with houses on stilts. But for me, kampong houses, there are many other aspects of kampong houses that I like to draw upon. Kampong houses don't try to pretend to be anything more than what they are. So it's a very unpretentious, very honest, very direct way of making a house. And I really like that quality. I think in modern architecture, so often we try to make pretty for pretty sake. One of the challenges in the design of this house was the design of the screen, that it has very different spacing depending on what it lies behind it. So for example, when we needed the screen to act as a sunscreen to prevent the sun from coming to the rooms, the screen is more dense. And when we needed the screen to open up to allow plants to grow through it, then it is more open. So if you look from the outside, the, the screen has a very interesting varying pattern, which adds to the character of the house. So this is the front of the house, and you can see the, the detail of the timber screen with these various densities. From the very bottom, it is a bit less dense where the concrete slab is, and then it gets more dense when it needs to shade the rooms. And at the very top, the screen opens up to let the landscape bloom through it. I really like the look of it. It shows that, in the end, nature always wins. When we talk about kampong houses, we should really try and think about exactly what we mean by that, because we use that phrase really often, colloquially, just in conversation, referring to one thing or another, but what does it really mean? In essence, it's a social thing. It's about living in a social context, in a village context. That point about is often brought up in Singapore, you know, we'll refer to the kampong spirit with some affection. Often when we speak about kampong houses, we also refer to particular elements of a building. For example, a timber frame or an atap roof. There are other things that we might refer to, like a house being raised on stilts. What we can say is common across the spectrum of kampong houses might be, for example, their scale, but also the way that they've embodied these passive climatic design techniques. So things such as big overhangs that protect you from the sun and the rain, prevent those from entering the house. Uh, things like cross ventilation, having openings that will allow lots of breeze. Uh, tall internal spaces that will let the hot air rise above your head and often it will be expelled at height. And um, other things like sheltered outdoor areas so that you can enjoy breezes of the outdoors without being exposed to the sun. For this house, like most houses, the spatial planning is quite conventional. 
So on the first story, we have your living, dining, kitchen areas, which is the public spaces of the house, and including the service elements where the utility areas, the laundry, the storerooms are. And this first story is very, very open. It is like a kampung house raised on stilts. Yeah, so, and it has a very direct relationship to the landscape around it. For the second and third levels, it is where all the bedrooms are. And here it is where we shift the whole house with a timber screen that faded. And on the very top level, we have planting very close to all the rooms itself. Major concerns for the homeowner was the climatic comfort of the house. So they wanted to be sure that the house was not hot and that it was very well ventilated. And I'm very glad to say that what we have designed has, has worked very well in terms of that. It's a very, very breezy house uh, because of the way the openings are situated on all sides of the house. But it's also not hot because of the way the screens have uh, acted. And I would say the landscaping, the green also helped to shade it uh, tremendously. So uh, from a climatic point of view, we are very happy with how houses perform. Passive climatic design essentially is about living in a way that's compatible with the climate and designing spaces that will allow you to do that. It really emerged in the days before people had the means to mechanically cool their spaces with electric fans and air conditioners. It means designing in a way that's going to keep your space cool and as hospitable as possible, but using as little energy as you can. It's an integral part of vernacular housing, such as what we typically think of as kampong housing. This house has two main sustainability features. So the first one being photovoltaic cells or solar panels on a rooftop. Yeah, so this generates electricity, which will be fed back into the electrical grid. Because of that, the owner is able to get a rebate from the electrical bill that he gets every month. So in a way, it's a very green feature to have. And then the second main element is the rainwater harvesting. So rainwater is collected and stored in tanks, which is buried in the garden. And these are used for watering the plants, and for washing the car, or for any washing things that the house needs. For landed houses, we find owners increasingly wanting to incorporate sustainability features. And I think this is a part that everyone wants to play for climate change. So I would say that we can do a lot more. It will take some time, and it's a slowly evolving thing. There are several reasons why we're looking back to vernacular forms of housing for contemporary living. One of them, I would say, is sustainability. I think there's a, a rising consciousness of the need to be sustainable in everything we do because climate change is accelerating and we can't deny it any longer. Another reason, I think, is the slower pace of life that we seek these days, which I think a lot of us encountered during the COVID lockdown. We're so tied to our devices and screens. I think we're really seeking opportunities to just experience the elements, experience relaxation at home, and just be present in the moment. I think that everybody can adopt a sensibility for tropical living very easily. It's just about being sensitive to your place in the world. And in our case, that means being on the equator in a very hot and humid environment. So being sensitive to that, making decisions about how your built form is crafted, about how it's choreographed spatially. With the sensibility towards tropical living in mind, every step you take will so naturally evolve into a sustainable outcome. In essence, it's about a sensibility and living sensitively in your place. To me, home is a place where you feel comfortable, physically, socially, ethically and emotionally. And it's, it's a base where you can recharge your energy and soothe your soul. Kampong houses, just like sustainability, is like a buzzword. 
but we tend not to look at it from a nostalgic point of view. Not that there's nothing to learn from it, but I think if we romanticize about it as a form of icon, right, uh, we will not be able to really go deeper into the sort of um, vernacular intelligence that is present. Very simply, if you use less air conditioning, you open up the house, you allow airflow to go through, uh, you basically are consuming less energy. So it's as simple as reducing your energy consumption. And then if you have a lot of uh, windows, uh, there's a lot of natural light. Again, then you reduce the use of you know, your lighting and all that. So I mean, all this adds up. They add up to creating a more sustainable kind of uh, environment for living in. One of the great contributions, if you like, of uh, harking back to uh, learning something from uh, Kampung House or just the idea of uh, the tropical, if you like, as an imaginary. We want to rethink the reliance on air conditioning and to say, hey, uh, people could live in houses without air conditioning. They had other means of ventilating and making the space airy. And so perhaps, you know, where do we look for this? And that's one of the reasons people look back to the Kampung House. Oh,